My name is Mike Jackson, or Michael Jackson. My students love to make fun of that name. I teach uh, at Rebecca Nazarene University in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in the religion department. I teach preaching, and uh, homiletics is kind of where my specialty lies. And I'm currently just starting uh, this semester a sabbatical, which I'm going to explore something uh, that has been sort of resonating with me for a while. And a good bit of that will be uh, a part of what's been resonating and I'm wanting to explore uh, will be a part of this presentation. But to get things rolling, what I'd like to do is uh, open with the words uh, of the great prophet uh, theologian named Bob Dylan. Okay, that's classic Dylan. It's like, what did he say again? <laughs> All right, so if you're not real familiar with that uh, old hit, come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if your time to you is worth saving. And then the words that I think are really prophetic and important, you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a-changing. He sang this back in the 60s. And here we are now, a half a century later, and we can say without any question the times really are changing. They are changing so rapidly and so quickly that the question really becomes, in other words, for us, what in the world is going on in this rapid uh, transitional time that we live in? And for us who preach, we want to know what does that really mean for the church? And as a homiletician, I want to ask, what does it mean specifically for preaching? How does preaching speak uh, faithfully into a world that is changing so rapidly? And I think that uh, that is a very, very important question. What has prompted this question for me is a book uh, by a good friend of mine, uh, David Lowe's, who I really believe has written more about preaching in a postmodern uh, context, in a postmodern world, uh, than, than any other uh, homiletics uh, person that I know. And he is a personal friend, and I've, I've just sort of saturated myself in his work and in this book uh, in particular. Um, my favorite quote in the book is this. He claims that preaching in a postmodern world, it is not a problem to be solved. That we don't come to homiletics and say, okay, how do we solve this problem of preaching? It's more a mystery for us to embrace and live out of, or maybe you would want to say for a better word for a mystery, is to live into that mystery. And I think that a lot of his work really flows out of this deep conviction that most of us, um, I, I think, would, would, would kind of agree with this, this conviction that, that arises out of uh, scriptural testimony, I think it's summarized fairly well in 1 Peter chapter 2, when we are reminded of who we are and what our calling is in the world. I think the question of identity and vocation uh, are, are the huge questions that need to be answered in our world. And, and 1 Peter 2 says that we are a chosen, I prefer the translation, we are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and here's where that word comes in, either a peculiar people, a people who are God's special treasure, possession, a people who belong to God. That is who we are and why we are here. What our, what our uh, vocation is, is to declare or proclaim the excellencies, the praises of the one who has called us out of darkness into marvelous light. So the, this, this idea that I think David really wrestles with in the book has kind of been summarized for me in, uh, and I'm paraphrasing Will Willimon, who I think is paraphrasing Martin Luther, because I've searched Luther and I can't find this exact quote, but Willimon claims that Luther said, all right, that we clergy are to live out our baptism. That means 
our vocation, our, our calling. We are to live out our baptism by preaching to the church in order that or so that the church might live out her baptism, her, her vocational calling by preaching to the world. And I, I love that, that that connection. And what it says to me is this, that preaching really is the vocation of the whole people of God. It is not simply the vocation of those of us who have been called to be ordained clergy in the church. That maybe when we do our work best, we are creating uh, you know, multitudes of preachers who extend the work of preaching into the world. Now, if we believe that, and I really do, we believe that preaching is the vocation of the whole people of God, then I want to say, along with uh, Tom Hanks and Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem. And the problem, I think, uh, David identifies very clearly. For years, for decades, I have heard my colleagues, fellow pastors who have come uh, to our university for workshops and training, and they have bemoaned and they have just... Uh, they, they have lamented over the fact that our people just don't know the Bible anymore. There is so much biblical illiteracy. And I would agree. I think that one of the problems today is biblical literacy. But I want you to think about literacy in this way. That biblical literacy has everything to do with people knowing the vocabulary of our faith. And by vocabulary, I don't just mean vocabulary words. But the, the vocabulary of the Christian faith are the stories, the witnesses that have been collected in our Bible that tell us who God is, what God is doing, who we are called to be. The, those stories, uh, we cannot assume any longer that our folks just just automatically... Oh, you need that, you need that for me. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. We cannot assume any longer that our people just know those stories. You can make a reference to a story. And, and there was a time when people would know exactly what you're talking to and what you're talking about. But you could talk about Job uh, or just make a reference to Job and, and, and people aren't sure at all of the story of Job because they just haven't read it. And it's important that people know the vocabulary of the faith. But David claims, and this is where I appreciate his work so much, that there is something deeper at stake. And the problem that we have for... Uh, for this current time is not just biblical literacy. It's not just the vocabulary faith, but it's what David wants to call biblical fluency. That we may even know stories of the Bible, but we don't know how to use them rightly. We don't know the grammar of the faith. We don't know how to interpret stories correctly so that these stories help us make sense of who God is. Because honestly, I've heard some preaching and and more than preaching, folk theology out there that really doesn't describe the kind of God I believe is born witness to in the scriptures. Uh, people, there's a, there's a great disconnect uh, in terms of being able to take the stories of the Bible and to use them according to the grammar of faith in ways that will narrate God, the world, and who we are faithfully. So is the suggestion that instead of focusing or lamenting the lack of biblical literacy, that the focus should be biblical fluency? I, I think that David would say we've got to work for both. That, that the, maybe the first step is to teach the, the vocabulary of faith. I, I mean, I teach Hebrew at, at my place. And you know, I mean, we teach vocabulary words. But if all I was doing was teaching vocabulary words and they didn't understand how the Hebrew language functions mm -hmm. and how the grammar functions, then that vocabulary yeah. basically becomes meaningless right, right. Uh, for them to be able to take a text and read and interpret and make sense of it. Right. And so David would say, yeah, we do need to, to, to get people more engaged in Scripture so they know the stories. But we've got a bigger task than that. In other words, if, if, if that's the bar, we've got to raise the bar higher and say not only do we need to address this issue of literacy, but we need to address the issue of fluency. If that makes sense. It does. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so that's a good question, though. He's not, he's not throwing one out and just saying let's focus on fluency. Uh, that, that is correct. So I have come to call this... Um, this condition that we find ourselves in, that David sort of uh,
lays out in his book. I'll try and stay closer to this. Do I need to hold on to it? All right. I, I'm, I'm used to talking to groups of 80 people without a microphone, and so this is a... Uh, this will be unusual, but I'll do it. Um, but I, I like to call this convergence of, of cultural forces that we see happening in our, uh, in our context today. It's really the perfect storm that has created a, a huge kind of disorientation for the church. And the way that Der David narrates it is because I want, to, I want to just spend a few minutes just sort of describing describing what is changing about our world. And then I'm trying to build on some of his just preliminary suggestions of how we as preachers might address this in our preaching and create uh, a kind of people who can fulfill their calling, uh, the, the vocation of the whole people of God, um, which is to preach the gospel to the whole world. Again, not just the work of the clergy, but the work of the whole people of God. And so David identifies basically three um, kind of cultural forces that are at work in our world. And the first one of them he calls postmodernity or postmodernism. I like to just uh, refer to it in, in the storm language as these troubling winds, if you will, of uh, postmodernism. Um, what I want you to think about is that the the big questions that were that were raised in in the ancient world were questions that had to do with life with with death it was just questions of survival and what is life you know made of and you know uh, questions of, of of ontology those were those were big questions in the ancient world but as we moved into the middle ages especially in the church the central questions seemed to revolve around Questions about guilt, forgiveness, all the theories of atonement sort of sprang up during that time, trying to wrestle with and understand human guilt and, and, and forgiveness. But then we moved into modernity. I am a child of that world of modernity. And in modernity, we were more uh, concerned about questions of existence and meaning, and those were the big quests and, 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 and knowledge and, and how we know what we know. Those were the big questions. But a shift took place. It's taken place in the last 50 to 100 years, depending on whether you're talking about architecture, philosophy, or especially even in religious thought. And, and much of the church is just now getting caught up into that uh, shift that in a postmodern world, the primary questions revolve around issues of truth and language. And what David claims, and again, I'm, I'm just sketching this out for you real quickly, uh, that postmodernity tends to be skeptical about three things. One is, what is truth? You know, what what is truth? Um, and we'll, we can talk about that a little bit more. A, a second real skepticism in a postmodern world is the function of language. What is it that language does? We were always taught, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, we were always taught that language describes things. But in a postmodern world, language has a much bigger function than that. And a third uh, concern or skepticism that you find in a postmodern world is the role of tradition. I mean, just because we've always done it this way, that doesn't mean we have to do it this way now. And postmoderns are very quick to just run toward that and say, you know, why do we care about what, what we did 50 years ago, 100 years ago? And so the tradition kind of, you know, gets up, is up for grabs in this. But what you need to understand, what David wants you to understand is this, that it's not the idea of truth itself that is in question that we're skeptical about in this age, but it is that whether or not truth can be absolute, universal, uncontested. That is the, that is the core idea in a postmodern world, which means that for we, in our, in our faith tradition, we have to ask this question. How can we, in a world like this, claim that the Christian story is true? And that becomes a huge a huge question. Now, let's, uh, let's look at this from a, a little bit of a different perspective. I don't know if there are any of you in this room. Well, maybe Jay. I don't know. Maybe not even Jay. I think he's too young. I don't know if, if any of you ever remember this date, July the 20th, 1969. I was in Maynardville, Tennessee, 
It's a little town north of Nashville at my, at my granny's house. And she had one of those little box TVs with a black and white screen about that big. But I watched the Apollo 11 moon landing and I watched as Neil Armstrong stepped off of the lunar module, planted his foot. And do you remember what he said? No, you don't. For mankind, very, very good. Yeah, it's a classic, classic words. So here is this event in human history. And the question is, did that really happen? You, yes, it, it happened. How many of you would say it happened? Okay, I'm just going to ask you to do this. Prove it. Prove it to me. You're convinced it happened. Well, the technology to fake it was not around yet. And it was more, it was, would have been cheaper to actually went to the moon than to try and fake it on a movie set. Okay. I've been to a, I've, I've been to the top of a, of a volcano in Maui, and it sure looked a lot like the moon landing to me. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah, you're a good postmodern thinker right there. Okay, and, and see, in a postmodern world, that really isn't even the question anymore. I believe that it happened, but the reason that I believe that is because I trust the testimony of people who told me it's true. I mean, I, that, that really is it. But in a postmodern world, that's not even the important question. Did it happen? The important question is really this. On July 20th, 1969, on the surface of the moon... What happened? What was going on there? And what was its significance? Was this simply an amazing feat of American engineering? Was this instead, um, as some people would want to claim, this was a political move that we did back in the, uh, the heaviest part of the Cold War to try and best the Russians, to beat them at one thing, because they had already crash-landed... <laughs> um, uh, uh, a, a space flight on the moon. They had already reached the moon. Not Including biblical text. I've played this game before. What I want you to do is I want you to think one word, but don't say it out loud. Tell me what you see using one word. Okay? Here's a picture. Okay, who who's sees something that they could tell? Young lady right there, what do you see? You see a duck? Absolutely. Uh, that, that is exactly what that is a picture of. It is a duck. No disagreements, right? No, it's not. It can't be a rabbit. It's a duck. Where do you see a rabbit? Oh, well, by golly, it is a rabbit. Do you see a rabbit? But you told me it was a duck. So which is it? 
How many of you think it's both? Can I tell you this? It can't be both. But it can be either one. Why can't it be both? Because if it is a duck, then what is this? Bills. And rabbits don't have bills. And what this is is called a gestalt image because it can be either one, but what it requires is for you to have a new language and a new lens that helps you see it in a new way. So I can look at this through the lens of duck and see a duck, or I can look at the exact same data and interpret it differently. But when I do that, this no longer is a bill. If this is a rabbit, then these, these are ears. Got it? Okay. So let's do it with a little more complex picture. Now you get two words to describe what you see. Okay. Two words. Somebody see something? Um, all the way in the back. Yes, sir. You see a young lady. Okay. How many of you see a young lady? Okay. And some of you see something different? What do you, what do you see, Megan? An old hag. Right? That's a good way to describe it. Okay. How many of you cannot see a young lady? Everybody sees a young lady? Come be honest, it's okay. Everybody sees a young lady. Is there anyone that cannot see the old hag? Can't see the old hag. Let me help you out there. If you are looking at this picture and you're thinking of young lady, then what you see right here is a nice kind of slim chin that's pointed away. But if you think old hag, this is no longer a nice thin chin, but it is a big honking nose. Oh, okay. And this is not a petite little ear, but this is a very sad eye. And this is not a necklace around her neck, but this is just a gritted mouth. And her chin is way down here, kind of jaded. Anybody still not see the old lady? Still don't see it? You know, I taught this uh, several years ago, and there was a young lady in the class, and she goes, I don't see an old hag. I don't see an old hag. And we went on, and I left the picture up there just accidentally. And about 30 minutes later, she goes, I see her now. <laughs> it's like she had just zoned out of everything. She said, I got to find that old hag, right? Um, but again, uh, the, the paradigm, the interpretive lens that we use shapes how we how we interpret each individual part of that data. And it's very, very important to recognize the significance of interpretation in the postmodern world has just given voice to that. Um, here's another one. This one's pretty easy, really. But let's see what, what you see. Okay, who, who sees something? Uh, gentleman right there in the coat. Yes. Talking, okay, two people talking. Uh, my students usually say two people about to kiss because they're all romantics, you know. And it's ring by spring at Trevecca. So uh, what did you see? A chalice, an hourglass, maybe a vase or something like that. Yeah, yeah, and perspective again. Perspective and interpretation is everything. I'm going to give you one more picture. And uh, I want you to tell me, if you see anything at all in this picture. And um, so here we go. And this is not an advertisement for Chick-fil-A, okay? <laughs> Does anybody see anything in this picture? Josh. Oh, there is somebody here that's spiritual. Thank the Lord. Jesus is right there in the center of that picture, isn't he? Now, you didn't see him until he said Jesus. But once he said Jesus, you saw him. How many of you don't see Jesus? Oh, we'll have an altar call right now, okay? We want you to come see Jesus. We gotta, we, I got to help you see Jesus. Okay, well, let's see if I can help you. If, if you see Jesus in this picture, his face is right here, but it's cut off just like right there at the head. Does that help? Now you see Jesus. My, my work here is done. 
All right. I, I've helped one person see Jesus today. I can, I can go home. I, I wonder if I could report that as a statistic, right? Huh? There you go. There you go. Still don't see Jesus. Okay. You still don't see Jesus? Oh, my God. Imagine if the light is kind of shining on him from this way. So this part of his face is in the light, and this is kind of in the shadows. And there's an eye there and an eye there, and this is kind of his beard, and this is kind of his shoulders. Help. Well, that's a whole other conversation, okay? <laughs> As soon, and isn't that interesting that as soon as you are given a lens to see it, you can interpret that data in that particular way, okay? Um, that's what the postmodern world has done to us. It's a mystery to be embraced. It's not a problem to be solved, and it's not something to bemoan. It's, in many ways, it is a gift to the church, uh, an invitation for us to become more faithful in our interpretation. So here's kind of um, the implications. What does this mean for us as preachers? Well, one of the things that David says, and I certainly agree with this, is for us to, to understand again the, that reality for us human beings is very much a function of narrative, that our lives are, that we make sense of our lives uh, by the stories that we inhabit, by the stories that kind of shape us and mold us. And so that preaching is shifting, and it has been shifting probably ever since Fred Craddock, uh, you know, sounded his bomb in the, in the 1970s. It's been shifting from a propositional method of declaring absolute truths to a more narrative quality that that what preaching is about is a, the confession, or what I like to use in my tradition, the testimony of the preacher or of the church that aligns with the witness of Scripture and rests very deeply upon the integrity of the one who is making the confession. A second implication for preaching is to understand that language doesn't simply describe things. That language, and it's why what we do in our preaching and the word choices that we make matter so much, that language actually is productive, or I like to use the word, it construes or it constructs a whole new reality. Any Little Mermaid fans here? Okay. You know the story of Ariel, and she finds this... Um, this artifact on the bottom of the ocean in a shipwreck, and she brings it to, and I, I don't remember all the names. Is it Scully? Is that? Yeah. Scuttle. Yeah, yeah. Brings it to Scuttle. What is this? And Scuttle says, this is a dingle hopper. And you use it to comb your hair. And when Ariel gets into the world above the sea, and she picks up this, what we would call a fork, it's not an instrument or to, to be used for eating. It has been reconstrued for her by the language. This is a dingle hopper. And she immediately begins to use it to comb her hair. That postmoderns understand how language doesn't just describe things. It actually produces meaning. And a third uh, implication for preaching and I think that this one is, is extremely important, uh, especially in my tradition as a Wesleyan, is that truth now is validated through experience. And doctrine and beliefs function to help us make sense of life's experience. So as we begin to preach in a postmodern world, World, experience kind of comes to the forefront as ways that we connect with, um, with our audience. So again, this is real quick, uh, kind of down and dirty, but one of the um, uh, implications that I want to say about that, since we are people of the book, we preachers, I, I want to contend, should practice this kind of imaginative and faithful interpretation as we do the work of pastoral theologians in our churches not just preaching, but also teaching our people the language and the grammar of the faith, the stories of, of the Bible and how to interpret them well. 
um, that we want to teach them to do that imaginative work with us, to invite them into that work with us so that they might become more than just literate but fluent. Because the only way that you're going to do that is the way I learned how to, how to speak English. I practiced it. You know, I was given some words, but I had to learn how to put those words together. Um, and, and so we want to invite them into those practices. And so where David ends up in this, and this is uh, as my sabbatical begins uh, on Friday, um, this, is, this is really going to be the exploration of, of, of my sabbatical work is how can we preachers, and I'm going to be talking with preachers all around the country, how can we move our people into a more of a, of a homiletic conversation so that we are moving from what David wants to call preaching as a performance, that we preachers, we get up and we just do well, so everybody says, good job, preacher, you did, you did good today, moving from a performative homiletic to what he wants to call a participatory one, where people are involved and engaged in the creation of proclamation of and incarnation of, if you will, the, the, the preached word, week in and week out, to produce a people that are much more biblically fluent. And all of that rises out of this postmodern world where interpretation is everything. A second, if you will, um, force that is at work, and I'm just going to skirt on this one pretty briefly, it's what I like to call the crashing waves of secularism. And David identifies kind of three um, characteristics of, of the secular world as it impacts the life of faith. One is the loss of transcendence. I don't know about your tribe, but in my tribe, more and more people don't talk about going into the sanctuary. You know, think about that word, a sanctuary, a holy place a safe place to meet a dangerous God and let a dangerous God do God's dangerous work in your life and to encounter the holy. And we started talking about them as auditoriums or if you're big enough, an arena. And it's almost like it's a place to be entertained rather than to encounter the holy. And we've done that and church growth movement really helped us do that because we want to attract all these unchurched people. Um, and so there's been a loss of transcendence with the with the rise of secularism. There has also been this triumph of the imminent, wanting things that are here and now that I can see, feel, touch, and taste that are right in front of me rather than the transcendent. And then a third, and I think this is, this is a critical loss that secularism has done, not only in people who are not believers, but even amongst us in the church, is that our people seem to have lost their capacity to see and name God in the ordinary events of their everyday lives. We just lost that capacity um, to, to see and name God. And, and so the question becomes, how, how is Christianity and what we preach week in and week out even relevant to the way that we live our lives week in and week out? So I'm going to show you a picture that's in David's book. Uh, he was at a lay conference on vocation where people were wrestling with the idea of what is my calling as a, as a person of faith? And they were asked to talk about how does faith connect to your everyday life? And the group produced this picture. And I, wanted, I want you to tell me in this picture, what do you see and notice about this picture? What are, what are, what are some insights that you, that you get, get from this? Church and, and, and business world, they seem to be of equal size, of equal importance even. Okay, good. What do you see? There is a separation, a gap. And that person is trying to bridge that gap with his legs. And if the gap grows much wider, that's a recipe for a hernia right there, right? Okay. What else do you see? Okay. Ah, now, you know, the way that David interpreted that was that the people have a strong connection to the secular world, but they seem to have a disconnection to the church world. But I like the way you narrated that, that there is a 
there is a connection that's coming from the secular world that really resonates with people, and the church's efforts are falling a bit short. Yeah, what else do you see? And there is a dark cloud over that other part of their lives. It's not like one of the saddest pictures in the world, but it's a description, if you will, of, of what secularism has done. Another insight? Ah, interesting. Interesting observation as well. Well, this is the work that secularism has done uh, in, in us and, and, and to our faith. And there are some implications for that um, for our preaching as well. David suggests, and one of those is that he says that it is becoming more and more critical that we preachers help bridge this Sunday-Monday disconnect. In fact, as a preacher, you're probably not going to like one of the things that he recommends, but he says that preachers ought to spend more time visiting their congregants in their places of work and just go there and watch and observe and listen and pay attention to what's going on and, and allow that to shape and inform the kind of questions that you are going to bring to the text for your people. But we've got to do a better job, David thinks, of bridging that disconnect between what's going on in Sunday, on Sunday and how that makes a, a bit of difference in what's going on in, and, and I hate this. I, I, I hate this. When I, when I preached, well, back when I was preaching and pastoring all the time, and people would say, yeah, but that's not what it's like in the real world. And I keep wanting to say, you're not living in the real world. That world that you're living in isn't the real world. The gospel is the real world. Uh, but, but helping them to bridge that disconnect. I, I failed at it uh, more often than not, not really bridging that disconnect. That's one of the, one of the implications about secularism. Another one kind of goes along with, I want to teach my people, and I do this with my students, I want to teach them... Uh, to be able to see and name God in their world, in the ordinary experiences of their everyday lives. One of the things that I do with my students, whether or not they are religion students, because I teach general education classes, um, and, and we talk about just the Christian vocation in, in light of what their particular uh, calling to be music people or doctors or whatever field and, uh, of endeavor they're going into. Um, one of the things that I teach them to do is to write parables, to find just ordinary things going on in their world and turn them into stories about who God is and how God is at work. My favorite one, I wish I'd, I wish I'd brought it. My favorite one was by a student. He, call, he called it the land and the sea. And he talks about how the sea will crash in on the land but then it always moves away, but then it always comes back. And every time it crashes in, it drags some of the land back, the, back into it. But the land is always there, always faithfully waiting the, the return of the faithless sea. And it became a parable of God being the land and the people of God being this fickle sea that's back and forth all the time. And it was just a beautiful observation and story, uh, and this ability to... To, to do what, what some of our great writers, like Annie Dillard, who teaches us grace is everywhere. If we will just pay attention and, and, and develop what I call gospel eyes, to see God at work in the ordinary events of our everyday lives. To equip people to do that is another implication for preaching. And then a final one, and it's more about what Sunday is all about than just preaching, but to reverse what David calls the directional energy of the, Sunday, of the congregation and to recognize that what we do on Sunday is not the main game, that it's like dress rehearsal for the main play that is going to go on as the people filled with God's spirit and God's love and God's word go out into the world and they live the gospel out in their world. That's where the main game is, or he would call it, it's the practice field. And to understand that what we do on Sunday is preparing people to do the real work of ministry in the world. And, and so engaging people in the homiletic conversation becomes critical 
to develop them into, into a people of, um, of biblical fluency. And then um, the last force that David talks about along with postmodernism and secularism is this rise, this what I call the deafening thunder of pluralism. Um, here's a quote from, from uh, Lowe's. This postmodern secular technological age has created a deep crisis, a mistrust of tradition or religion, this loss of transcendence. And he says, and yet in the midst of all of that, there is still a deep yearning, a uh, hunger as the deer pants for streams of water, Megan, so my soul thirsts for God. That is still, that is still around in people. Um, but there's a problem. We just have too much information coming in all the time. There are so many voices. They are so loud. There is so much noise all around us. Which voice or better story do we pay attention to? Which story do we give preference to? Do we allow to be the, the, the story that primarily shapes who we are? In an age of digital pluralism, a vast array and diversity of ideas, values, and convictions are now mediated to us. Think about that. That in a world of an information-rich world like we live in, we are being... Uh, what's being mediated to us on, a, on an ongoing basis are ideas, values, and convictions. And so the question for the church becomes, which story is going to be the most reliable or trustworthy worthy story for us to construct, if you will, an identity and a vocation? Well, uh, a couple of things that David notes, uh, but before he does that, I, I thought about this. What are some of the primary stories that shape us in our particular American uh, cultural context? Well, one of them is the story that is told by Madison Avenue that spends an awful lot of money to tell us that we are nothing more than a bundle of materialistic desires and consumer needs. And so the mantra that will bring fulfillment to your life is shop till you drop. You know, the one who gets the most goodies wins. Just get as much as you can get right now. That's the Madison Avenue story. The story of conspicuous consumerism. And we have bought into it hook, line, and sinker. I won't even ask how many of you already have the iPhone 10. Okay? Um, but, you know, we're there. Hollywood, they tell us a story that if you want a fulfilled life, if you want a good life, if you want a, a, a satisfying life, become a beautiful, and beautiful is by their standards, a beautiful person, find fulfillment in sex and sexuality. Now, and sensuality, now that's, a, that's a little bit of reductionistic, and I know all of these are, but we see that tendency to kind of live into that story. Or the story of Wall Street. You know, Gordon Gecko, greed is good. You know, uh, it's all about wealth, and the secret to happiness is accumulate wealth and power and success. But I would even contend that is... As seductive as these stories are, that maybe the most penetrating and most seductive story of all is just the overall American story, a story that is rooted in rugged individualism. I know when I started on this journey back in the 90s, a friend of mine um, who was teaching at a, at a school, and I asked him, I said, you know, I haven't read much good lately. What should I read? He said, have you read Habits of the Heart? Is if you have not read that book, you have to read it to begin to understand the trajectory of where our culture is, is, is going. And, and in Habits of the Heart, they talk about this spirit of rugged individualism, that we can make it on our own, that we are all about freedom and doing our own thing, and that we have been given inalienable rights, the right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. And by the way, do you know that the gospel doesn't speak of any of those things as rights? I mean, in fact, life in the Bible is always gift. It is never something we, are, we have a right to. Liberty, 
According to Paul, liberty just means finding a new master. And the Bible really doesn't care nearly as much about our happiness as it does our holiness. Uh, you see, the gospel of Jesus is telling a very different story. Well, one of the things that David has noted, and again, I'm just summarizing this before we go to the implications for preaching and, and pluralism. But if you think about it, this age of pluralism has created some major cultural shifts, um, especially because of the internet and the availability of information digitally that we now have, that we have now moved from what was once a mononarrative culture. In other words, we had one story that kind of defined us to now we live in multiple stories at the same time. We are a multiple narrative culture. We have moved from being people who are driven by duty to being discretionary people. That duty is not the drive that it was, certainly not for my parents, and for this new generation. That we have moved from an identity that we receive from others to an identity that we construe for ourselves. We want to be engaged and involved in the making of all kind of meaning. We won't even let television shows, you know, finish out on their own. We've got to be involved and vote somebody off the island. You know, we have to make that decision. Um, we have moved from the priority of tradition to the priority of experience. We have moved, this is important, from what was once a coherent identity that we knew who we were and who we were kind of defined how we lived in all realms of life to now we have a segmented identity. This is who I am at school. This is who I am at work. This is who I am uh, in my neighborhood. This is who I am in my family situation. And so we live these multiple identities uh, all at once. And that finally, we have moved from becoming just consumers of information to where we are actually producing information. That when the web moved to web 2.0 and now people weren't just using the web to discover what does Wikipedia say? By golly, I can change what Wikipedia says and I can give it my own content. And, and we want to be more engaged and involved in that. So David says that there's some implications for our preaching because of pluralism as well. One of those is to just recognize I mean, we shouldn't have to apologize for the Christian story. We do believe at the very depths of our being, this is the greatest story ever told. But let's face it. Sometimes the secular world just tells their rotten stories better than we do. We got to learn to tell our story better in a more compelling and uh, a more effective way. This is why he says we need to move from a performative homiletic where everything rides on the preacher's performance to a participatory one where the people of God are engaged in the, in the preaching event at every single level so that preaching and the interpretation of Scripture become this communal and contextual practice and not an individual or objective uh, practice, and that we become uh, or we produce a people who are much more biblically, not only literate, but to begin to use this language that they are biblically fluent. They not only know the stories of the, of the Bible, but they know how to interpret them rightly and well because they are practicing that on a regular basis. So that's all descriptive. That's all been descriptive. And what I'm really working on is trying to, to take what David suggests in his book and say, all right, what does that look like in practice? And this is where I, I would really welcome your feedback and your input on this. Um, here's, here's some of the things that I believe. Well, this is one of my favorite quotes of all time, you know, and it's, it's for all of us. St. Francis, preach the gospel at all times when necessary, use words. Um, and it is necessary often to use words. And, and we've got to help our people be equipped uh, to do that. So I am thinking that in order to open up the preaching conversation and to make preaching more participatory with the end goal of producing a people who are more biblically literate and fluent, that there are some practices that we uh, that, that we can engage in as preachers to help move the church in this direction. 
And I want to suggest some of those to you and then get some feedback from you. Maybe some of you are a part of communities that are already doing this, or your imagination can think of some, some other ways that this might work. And at, at the end of the day, I would love to give you my email address. And as you think about these kind of things, or you discover or hear about them, to let me know that as I'm working on this research, um, you know, this, this, uh, this coming year. Um, you know, one of the things I, I find really fascinating uh, in the Gospels is that Jesus, he had to be the greatest preacher of all time. And he preached in parables. And the parables didn't answer people's questions. They, invite, they, they basically raised questions and invited people into a conversational journey. And he produced a, a group of followers that, you know, sometimes they needed, they needed a little help and understanding, but it produced a group of followers that literally turned the world upside down. And he was gone. And they kept preaching and proclaiming. Um, and so I want to be a part of a movement uh, in the world, in the church, uh, in the latter years of my life that encourages this kind of more participatory homiletic. And here's some ideas. I think that it is very possible. In fact, I know it is because I've, I've experienced just a little bit of this, that it is possible to invite the, the, lay, the laity of your congregation into a conversation before you ever preach the sermon so that they help build and construct your sermon. It takes a lot of work. And I think you have to work a little bit in advance and, and, and you got to teach people some things. But there are some practices, and I've got a big list of them here, and I'm only going to talk about two or three of them. But um, behind each list, and I'd be glad to share this Prezi with any of you that are interested in it. I used this for a teaching uh, not long ago with a group of pastors. And behind this list, um, like I have ACF, ACF, that's Anna Carter Florence and her book, Preaching as Testimony, or Tom Long's book, The Witness of Preaching, or I think there's another book in there uh, by Tom Long, Preaching in the Literary Forms of the Bible. Um, and, and so I know I've got a couple of Walter Brueggemann texts in there. So different authors, and there's a bibliography at the end that, that relates to that, that introduce these kind of ideas that have mainly been given to the preacher. I want to contend that preachers, if we would do our job, would teach our congregations to do these practices as well and invite them into a dialogue with us early on um, as we are preparing our sermons, you know, weeks on down the road. Now, one of the things that I began to do um, after, um, after I kind of discovered that it really isn't that difficult to do is I started memorizing my passage of, of Scripture every week and reciting it from memory. I would rehearse it, rehearse it, rehearse it, and, um, and then embody it so that when I stood before the people and shared God's Word, it was literally inside of me. It was a part of me. Um, if I was pastoring today... I would find people who are gifted at doing that and I would encourage them to do that and I would have them share scripture every week and let the presentation of scripture before I preached on Sunday be the work of the people of God. And that could be a fun thing to do. And you could do it through Reader's Theater and get your creative people and artsy people going in that. I, I think that would be a wonderful thing. Uh, a couple of other practices here that I would, I would definitely teach my people to do. I teach my beginning preacher students that one of the first uh, ways that you pay attention to the text I don't turn to commentaries. I, in fact, I don't even read commentaries much anymore. But, but I even encourage my students, if you're going to look at a commentary, don't look at it till toward the end. Because if you're bearing witness to this text, you need to encounter the text for yourself. You need to see what the text is saying and how it's speaking to you. Because if it's not speaking to you, it's not going to speak through you. And so I, I tell them to pay attention to the text. And one of the ways I do this, especially with narratives, is... It's kind of like the old Ignatian method is just get into this, the, the text and, and let your senses come alive. You know, close your eyes and, and, and record the text. And, 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 and as it's being read over in, in, your, in your hearing, what do you see? And write that down and be very descriptive about the things that you see and what do you hear and what smells are evoked and what, what, uh, what 
textile? What, what, uh, what things can you actually feel and touch? Can you, do you feel the sand beneath your, beneath your feet and how warm it is? And, 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 and even is there taste uh, that, that are evoked in that? I have had more and more of my, my brand new preachers go, man, the scripture finally came alive for me just by, just by that simple practice. Teach, the, teach your people to do that. I mean, it's a great spiritual formation practice, but it's also a great practice to prepare for proclamation. But another one, and I want to kind of model this one for you, is get them to ask some good questions. And I usually have six or seven questions that I want to have people ask about every biblical text, um, the preacher, but teach your people to do this. And I want to tell you a story about this happening to me because I know it works, and I think there's a lot of other things you got to teach your people to do these practices and then invite them into a conversation. Because what I want to do in inviting feedback, and I do it at least a month before the sermon, so I have time to process what they have said and done. And if I'm you know, preaching every week, then I've got all kinds of groups that I'm meeting with and, and talking about Scripture with and getting their feedback. But invite feedback discuss the text beforehand and get together in feedback groups. And, and these days you can do that face-to-face -face or you can do it online just as easily. You don't have to schedule a special meeting at the church to do it. Or use email and social media blasts and send those out to the people of your congregation with a couple of questions that you want them to ask about the text and then, and then welcome their responses. If, if I was preaching today, I would get my readers, my, my people who are moviegoers, you know, all, all of my kind of savvy uh, cultural media folk, and, and I would put them together on a research team, and I would have them looking at, at all the things that are going on and just feeding me constantly stuff that maybe I'm not even aware of. I have my students do this uh, in, in my gen ed classes to give me, uh, movie ideas. And maybe there's a movie I haven't seen cause I, I show movie clips constantly as parables of what God, how, who God is and how God is at work in the world. And if you do this, I know that you'll get some good results. I want to tell you a story cause this, this genuinely happened. I, I dared to do this with a group on this scripture passage of Jesus and the garrison demoniac. The sea and he lands in this, in this land of the Gerasenes and immediately encounters this crazy man who's been living among the tombs and he's been chained up and he's filled with demons and he approaches Jesus and he says, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Stop tormenting me, I beg you. And Jesus had already you know, told the demons to be silent and then they beg Jesus, don't send us into the abyss. And then they say, there's a herd of pigs over there, send us into the pigs. And so he, he gives them permission and they go into the pigs and the pigs run off the cliff and into the lake and they drown. And the herdsmen go back to the town and they tell all the pig owners what's just happened. And everybody comes out and they are ticked off at Jesus. They tell him to get out of town. Even though they see that demon-possessed man clothed, sitting at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. But they, they beg Jesus to leave. And so Jesus gets ready to hightail it out of town. And the and the demon-possessed, or the formerly demon-possessed man, comes up and he begs Jesus. That word begging is in that story a lot. He begs Jesus, let me go with you. And Jesus says, no way. You go back and tell everybody what you've done. That was our text. It's a hard passage. And I really didn't know much what to do with it because I don't encounter demon possession every day. And, you know, it just didn't seem like a a very relevant text, especially for my sophisticated congregation. But I got a group of them together, and they started asking me questions. And Lois asked a question, and she said, you know something I've never understood about this story? Why in the world would they beg Jesus to leave when he had just done a really good thing with this crazy man? You'd think they'd want him to do more of that stuff. And I went, golly, Lois, I never thought about that. Maybe there's more going on here than this just being a story about healing. And then this guy, Alan, asked a question. He said, Pastor, where is this land of the Gerasenes? Well, you know, I'm seminary educated, so this is where I shine. And so I just reared up my chest and I go, I don't know. <laughs> Why would that even matter? I mean, it's, it's a place. But I told Alan, I said, you know what, I'll look it up and see. And much to my surprise, in the Gospel of Luke, the land of the Gerasenes, 
on the other side of Galilee, opposite Galilee, on the other side of the sea, is the only time in Luke's gospel that Jesus even steps a pinky toe out of the Holy Land. Now, I know Matthew says he moves down to Egypt, but Luke doesn't tell that story. It's the only time Jesus goes into Gentile territory. And good Jews don't go around where Gentiles are. Nor do they go around where dead people are, because that's a no-no. Nor do they go around where a bunch of pigs are. They don't go to swine country. And all of a sudden, this text that I thought was about healing becomes a text that's about the mission of God. And it made me title my sermon, What's a Nice Savior Like You Doing in a Place Like This? And it all came because he asked a simple question that I never thought to ask. And then Jim was in the group and he said, you know what I don't get is this guy that's been demon-possessed for all these years, he just got saved. He needs some time to be discipled. He wants to be with Jesus and Jesus won't even let him hang around him. I thought, quit asking these tough questions, okay? But what I really began to realize is this is the first missionary that Jesus employs in the gospel. And suddenly a story, of, of kind of a flat story that didn't make much uh, connection with my people about demon possession becomes a story about the mission of God and a God who will go into dangerous places and, and places that nobody else will go to bring the good news of deliverance. I mean, all of a sudden it became a, a real live story. Well, let me ask you real quick. Have any of you been a part of communities that practice this kind of pre-sermon engagement between clergy and laity? Yeah? What do you guys do? Oh, really? Yeah, it's, it, it's, a, it's a dynamic process, isn't it? I mean, it's life-giving. What are some other ways that, that this could happen, do you think? Um, yeah. The church I'm pastoring at, uh, this used to be the practice of had to change it because of schedule conflicts, but they used to do three weeks before the sermon, you read the sermon text in Bible study, and then you discussed it in the Bible study, and you had the congregants exegete the scripture Oh, yeah. Okay. So it actually became like the small group or the Sunday school curriculum before the sermon? Yeah. In, in a way? Nice. Boy, I love that. Good. Yeah, Justin. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just made you do them. I'm a mean guy. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, all of those kind of attend, what I call attending practices, um, you know, we use our imagination to do it, but imagine if you multiply your imagination through your congregation. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And extending it out to your family, I think, is a, is a first logical step and makes it really fun. It could be like a family devotional exercise. But to go that next step, I mean, 
I, I remember, and I know, I mean, for a while as I was a pastor, we had to preach two sermons, Sunday morning and Sunday night, and, and trying to get that done, and then had a Wednesday night service. I would completely turn what I did on Wednesday night into, into that kind of thing. It's just that I would probably be working on a text with a group of people on, on that particular Wednesday night weeks ahead of time, okay, to give me time to kind of process and give them time even for more feedback as well. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and also, if you anchor it in the congregation, then you're preaching very, very locally, if, if you know what I mean, and, and, and so you're feeding them kind of the local fare. Uh, you're, you're preaching the world that they actually inhabit and live in. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's another good way to do it is invite conversation partners in. I mean, if we really believe that preaching is the work of the whole church, then the more people we have involved in that conversation, I really believe the richer our preaching will be. And I also want to tell you this. When I preached that sermon a few weeks later, when I gave Alan credit for asking that question about the Gerasenes that I never would have thought to ask, I want you to know his shoulders went back a little bit, and he kind of strutted out of church saying, I helped the preacher preach today. <laughs> yeah, in fact, if it hadn't been for him, it wouldn't have been much of a sermon. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, so if I'm understanding you correctly, um, I was listening to a young preacher one time, and he was giving the story of when Jesus um, goes to Lazarus, and he kept saying how Jesus waited, Jesus waited, Jesus waited before he went, but he just kept saying waited, waited. And in my head, as I'm listening, I'm like, you need to explain why he waited. That the only custom was after three days, you know, that they would stay dead. Mm hmm Sure. Yeah. And, and it could be that the gift that you're giving and given in a conversation that you that you arrange, that you orchestrate weeks ahead, that at least somebody says, why do you think Jesus waited so long? And even if you haven't thought of the answer to that, it can spur you into areas that then when you preach it, you know that you're answering questions that people actually are asking. And I think that that's one of the ways that David says we're missing the Sunday to Monday disconnect, that we stand up there and proclaim good truth, but it's not about questions that people are even asking. And so they go away going, well, that was nice, but how does that make a difference and what I'm facing at work tomorrow, you know? So I, I think there's real value, significant value in this pre-sermon conversational engagement, okay? Um, a couple of other things. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think in a brainstorming session like that, you, you kind of just invite and you take the risk. Now, these groups are going to be small groups. When I did it, I made sure that they were as eclectic as they could possibly be. I invited teenagers into the group because, oh, man, I love teenagers. Their little snarky, you know, responses to, to, to text. But I got people of different age groups, different genders, different, different ethnicities. Uh, you know, I wanted as much diversity in a group of about eight people as I could get. And to give them permission to ask any question, to make any comment. I mean, hopefully in the conversation and dialogue, we, and, and especially in the sermon, if they said something that just seemed so off the wall, it might be an opportunity for me to say, now don't read this, even in the sermon. Now folks, don't read this that Jesus doesn't care about these things. You know, that's not really the purpose of this story. You know, I think that, 
I, I think that I wouldn't want to squelch conversation. Um, I want people to feel free, especially if you have teenagers in there. They need the permission to be able to, they're already going to feel a little intimidated, and I want them to feel that permission to just open up and share those things. That's a good question. Uh, this next one, I have to tell you, I don't have as much experience with, but I, I do have a friend I'm going to spend some time with. Uh, she... she uh, pastor is kind of a house church, and she's Charles Campbell's assistant at Duke. Um, and uh, in that context, she does a lot of direct interaction right in the middle of the sermon. So she'll just ask questions, and in her little group of 15 or 20 people that are gathered together, they have dialogue and conversation. I know that you can't do that sometimes, or sometimes you just don't want to do it because you got that crazy person in church and you just don't want them talking. But uh, mid-sermon practices that I think are some possibilities. There are ways that people could participate in your sermon non-verbally um, that, that might provide some feedback. Maybe you give them a sheet that has the text on it, and you challenge them to underline or highlight things that were significant to them as they heard the text being read. Maybe have them turn that in and see what were the most significant words or, or things that, you, that, that people heard. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan anymore. I used to be back in the church growth days. They said, you know, you should have these outlines with fill in the blank. But if you ask people at the end of the service or even in the middle of the service or, or right there at the end of the sermon, what, what was the central thing you heard in this sermon? Man, I think that would be good feedback for the preacher. Did they hear what I was trying to say? Um, I think that that could be helpful. You can use Twitter. Uh, I've never done that, um, but I know people who have not do it in class all the time or do it with a poll everywhere. But if you wanted people's opinion about something and you wanted to just get it right there, let's take a poll real quick and everybody, everybody get out your cell phone. They've already got them out anyway, you know. So look at your cell phones and turn to this and let's, and let's fill out this poll real quick. It's a way of getting some engagement and some feedback with people that could be very, very instant. Uh, answer questions, share stories. Um, I think that um, when you share stories that you've heard from, from, from this, you need to have permission, obviously. But are there ways for verbal participa participation in the sermon by the people in the congregation? I've experimented with a couple of these, and I can tell you, I think they can be very powerful if they're done rightly. Um, I've never really done in a large church setting. All right, let's break up into dialogue groups, groups mid-sermon. I've just, to me, that just kind of, that would just become, you know, mass chaos. And I, I don't do good managing by chaos, I don't think. But in a smaller setting, that could really work. Um, what does work, though, is inviting someone to share their testimony. Um, and it, it actually becomes like you're an illustration in your sermon, but you're not telling their story. You're inviting them up to tell their story. Now, typically, I would only do that. I would prepare the people in advance. I would know that what their story was, and I'd have them rehearse it with me. You know, you don't want them to get up there and say things that will just, you know, go completely off base. But to share a testimony of how that particular Scripture text has intersected their life in a meaningful way, there you've got the Word incarnated right in front of your congregation or weave in testimony with an interview or a table talk where you kind of guide the questions that you have um, you have the people responding to so that they can tell their story but you do it with a little bit of guidance I, I, br I brought them right up to the stage. Or when we did the table talk, I had a little table and a couple of bar stools up there, and, uh, and we just sat down and we just had a conversation. It's just like the two of us sitting over, over coffee at a table, and, and everybody was allowed to overhear that. Uh, I think that those are, those are some ways that that could happen. Um, where the testimonies and interpretations of the text, you might find that they actually become the sermon that people remember the most much more than anything that you said, because they saw the word fleshed out in the lives of people that they know and they respect and they love. An area that I really want to work on, and I know some people are doing some creative work with this, and those are some of the people I'm going to talk about, is what do you do after the sermon to keep the conversation alive? Uh, you know, we go into all this hard work to, to, to preach what we hope is a 
a good and effective and a meaningful sermon for people. And then we preachers, we're off the next week. I mean, you know, Sunday, Sunday night, I'm already thinking, okay, what's, what's coming next week? I got to get started on that. That happens in the lives of the people too. They hear the sermon and they walk out the door. How do you keep this conversation active and go an ongoing uh, after the sermon is over? Um, I think a wonderful practice that I would just call helping people to name God in the world is to encourage them, to give them, uh, at, it's almost like an assignment at the end of, as a part of their benediction and sending out. One of your responsibilities this week is to share back with us through email or through Facebook or through Twitter using the wonderful hashtag that we can all see. And you hashtag your sermon. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel has just done this so well with his hashtags that he sends out um, to share how you have seen God at work in your life in light of what the sermon was about. To just share that uh, out. A lot of churches that I know have shifted, and again, they're, they're reversing the directional energy of the congregation. They've shifted their Sunday school small groups to not meet before the worship service, but after. And so that what happens when the people break up into small groups is taking the sermon and uh, letting the implications of that sermon sort of you know, be fleshed out in their dialogue, in their classroom conversation. I think that can be a very effective way to make small groups in Sunday school work. One of my friends literally posts his sermon manuscript after he preaches it, and he invites dialogue and follow-up and questions, and there's this ongoing conversation that happens there. Here's one of my favorites, is, is just report how you have lived out the implications of the text uh, on the following Sunday, so that every week you invite one of your people to come up and share as a testimony, not in the middle of a sermon, but you know, sometime in the worship service before the sermon. Let me tell you how, how I saw that text come alive in my life last week. And to share that, I would uh, set up on my Facebook, uh, uh, on my webpage or a Facebook page that I have, uh, a section that's just called The Word Made flesh or could be the word made fresh, whichever one you wanted. And as people come and share those stories, those become, you know, posted testimonies with their permission to show how they have been living out the implications of the gospel in their life. And so I'm really interested, very interested in inviting people into that conversation, pre-sermon, mid-sermon, post-sermon. And if you have some thoughts or ideas or experiences of that, Please take down my email address. It's very simple. Just think of the name Michael Jackson and just write M. Jackson. I think I have it. Well, there's the bibliography. But I think I have it listed right there. M. Jackson at Trevecca.edu. And I invite you to be a part of my research project that, who knows, one day may result in a book, and I'll give you credit, okay? <laughs> Where credit is due, I would be glad to do that. I think we've kind of run out of time. Uh, is that right? Are we at 5 o'clock? Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm, I'll hang around for a few minutes if some of you have some questions or anything you'd like to share with me. A uh, final closing question, maybe? Pardon? Oh, can I go back to it? Yeah, or if you'd like, if you just email me, I'll send you the Prezi link. Hey, this stuff doesn't belong to me. When I do it for Treveca, they tell me it's their property, so I give it away for free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just send me an email if you'd like the Prezi and all that.